Thanks very much, and thanks for inviting me, and it's great to be here. I, uh, my talk has been very well set up by Brett Davis from Oracle, who was talking about the, the great promise of integrating data for healthcare and for discovery and for treatment of patients, and I'm really just going to tell you uh, a story about that today. So, I mean, the vision for next generation healthcare is that with population based databases of clinical data, as well as electronic medical records, as well as the kind of molecular markers that we've been talking about a lot today, we're going to be able to catalyze discovery both for generating hypotheses, but also for demonstrating their truth, or at least their initial truth. And we recently had an experience of this which really drove home to us the power of these data integration. Uh, capabilities. The reason we care about this is we're building the Farm GKB, uh, which is a NIH supported repository of all information that our curators can find about how human genetic variation leads to drug response phenotypes. However, once you care about that, you care deeply about understanding drug mechanisms and the full set of drug effects because you need to understand those fully in order to figure out how to personalize treatment. So we were drawn to the FDA Adverse Events Database, the uh, AERS. It's a publicly available data dump, and I mean dump in the most loving way, uh, uh, mostly from pharmaceutical companies and pharmacists, some MDs, where when an adverse event happens, it is reported to the FDA, and they make these reports available in text files on the web. You can get them right now. In general, these reports contain an adverse event or events experienced. The, oops, sorry. The medications that are taken by the patient, typically multiple, uh, the diseases that are being treated in the patient, and some demographic data. And when you first look at this, you say, oh my goodness, there's no way to figure out what's going on because of all of those S's in parentheses. I really don't know how to associate which adverse events from which medications in the context of which indication. So the question was, can we use the FDA database to discover drug-drug interactions? And I asked one of my students if he, Nick Tatnetti, if he thought he could do that. And he could. And the first thing he did is he built a statistical model for kind of a confidence builder. Can we recognize glucose-altering drugs based not on the fact that they're glucose-altering drugs, but based on their other fingerprints, by the company they keep in terms of other adverse events? So what we have here is a, a matrix, conceptually, with diabetes drugs and the c indications that are correlated with diabetes uh, as those little yellow boxes versus all the adverse events that are reported in this FDA database that I told you about. And we asked the question, can we find a pattern such that we can distinguish diabetes drugs uh, and their side effects from all other drugs and their side effects? And so here, conceptually, you see a few uh, columns where maybe there's a darker signal uh, uh, in, the, in the top uh, rows that are associated with these diabetes drugs. And of course, I'm sorry I can't go into the technical details of the data mining, but what we found was this pattern on the left, that there was about seven or eight clinical, sin, um, clinical adverse events, including paresthesia, depression, hypoglycemia, diabetes out of control, that's not surprising, fever, diarrhea, anorexia, some of them up in blue, some of them down in red, but when they occur, a very high likelihood, as shown by this receiver operator curve, um, which basically so shows that we have a 93% accuracy in recovering all known glucose altering, altering drugs based simply on that fingerprint. Okay, that's fine, but we all know what are glucose-altering drugs. That's not particularly useful, so who cares? Well, the reason we care is because of what Nick did next. He said, let me take pairs of drugs that patients are on in this FDA database, and let me look at the side effects that are being reported for patients who are on pairs of drugs, <coughs> excuse me, drugs, and let me see if any of those have a pattern similar to the pattern that we saw for known glucose-altering drugs. So he did this, relatively straightforward, because there's a lot of data, you get pretty good statistics, even despite the noise. And he walked into my office, this might have been an email, but it's more dramatic if I say he walked into my office. Um, 
And he said, Russ, here's four sets of drugs that get a very high signal. And I looked at them and immediately was drawn to the fourth pair at the bottom, uh, paroxetine or Paxil and pravastatin or Pravacol, because I'm a general internist and I know that there are millions of patients on those two drugs. So I said to him, well, if that's real, that's a big deal because there are many patients on these two drugs. And in fact, subsequently, we've learned that there's about 15 million US citizens, U Americans, on these two drugs individually. And based on our look at databases of, of patient records, about probably 500,000 to a million patients nationwide on these two drugs. So I said, that's the one to go after because that could be real. So we went to the Stanford Electronic Medical Record. My colleague Henry Lowe has built a research database, de-identified, available for research. And we, but what we needed was something special. We needed patients who were on one drug or the other and had a glucose measurement, which you might not have because there was no reason to suspect particularly that you needed to measure glucose. But you needed to find a patient who had one medicine or the other and a glucose measurement, then got the second medication, and then had another glucose me measurement. And in order to make it reasonable, we wanted all of those glucose measurements to happen within two months. So there's only 12 patients who like that in the Stanford medical record. But when he sent me this graph, as you can see, it was pretty impressive. Many of them were having their glucose go up. And in fact, that was striking, and it was up about 20 milligrams per deciliter. This is a random glucose, not a fasting, for those of you who, who study glucose. But it was sufficient. Now, this I thought, this is more interesting, but this is not very probative. It's 12 patients. It's uh, borderline at best. So we, uh, and there's the data. By the way, we also looked at patients on just paroxetine or just pravastatin, and their uh, glucose levels before and after were, were relatively flat. And then the blue there, with a lot of error bars, is what we were seeing. Intriguing, but not probative. So I called Dan Roden at Vanderbilt and Zach Kohani at Harvard, my, my friends, and I said, hey, we did this, and I know you guys have electronic medical records. Could you run queries in your databases to see if you're seeing similar phenomenon? And this is what we got from Vanderbilt. So that they had 18 patients and saw a very similar bump still with huge error bars. And so, to the credit of Harvard partners, they had 106 patients and also saw the same bump. So now I was saying, okay, now this is getting serious. We look like, uh, because in aggregate, we had a pretty good error bars on a fairly significant bump in glucose um, from, from, the electron from three separate electronic medical records when um, combined. Moreover, when we looked at other statins and other SSRI antidepressants from which paroxetine comes, it was mostly flat. We, this is a, not a class effect as far as we could tell. This is a specific effect of these specific drugs. Uh, and in, I think the, the best example of that is on the far left, which is all other statins and all other SSRIs in combination have basically a flat glucose before and after. Because I know you're wondering, maybe somebody, after you treat their depression and treat their cholesterol, maybe they eat more and they get glucose bumps. I know that that's what you're all thinking. You would have to come up with a more complicated story because it doesn't happen for other statins and other um, antidepressants. What really struck us was this graph. We had left out diabetics from the initial analysis because they have complicated glucose situations. But when we looked at diabetics in the same three data sets, uh, it was a very remarkable bump of about 50 milligrams, 50 to 60 milligrams per deciliter of glucose, which is enough if it's happening in a fasting uh, glucose measurement to bump somebody into, into frank type 2 diabetes. So the paper was submitted and accepted based on this data, but we were worried and we also wanted to get down to the cause, so Nick gave these drugs to mice. Uh, and what you see is uh, the second and third uh, bars are the paroxetine and pravastatin levels in mice on one drug. And then on the far right, you see the, glu I'm sorry, the glucose levels of, of mice on one drug or the other drug. And then at the far right, in a very significant bump in glucose for mice who were on both drugs. And then there's some uh, controls in there. And this was very significant, and in fact, 
uh, the bump in the glucose was very similar to the bump that we saw in the diabetics. It was about 50 milligrams per deciliter. So we're very excited about this. Um, what we learned from it, it to, to summarize, is this phishing expedition in the FDA database actually generated not a zillion hypotheses, but a manageable number of hypotheses. We were able to kind of use very basic decision theory about utility to pick one that was worth uh, following up on. And then because of the availability to us of a very powerful electronic medical record infrastructure, both at Stanford, Vanderbilt, and Harvard, we're able to test this. All this work happened in three weeks. It took a year to get the paper published. And it took a long time to feed the mice and learn how to do mice experiments. Um, so not this part, but everything up until then was one month. And I think really underscores the power that we are about to have and are having as we build this infrastructure of medical data, both population data, individual data in the EMR, and then the biomarkers that we're discussing. I haven't discussed biomarkers here explicitly, but we're doing very similar things in the context of looking at lab tests and, uh, other than glucose. Uh, and molecular markers, of course, because of our interest in um, pharmacogenomics. So I'll just finish up with conclusions. Uh, these population databases, like the, F the ones that the FDA makes available, are indeed noisy, biased, and filled with errors. Yet, you can scrub them, so to speak, to yield clinically relevant hypotheses. I would not bet the house on anything I learn in that database, but I would then go to the next point, which is maybe we should follow up. Second point is that electronic medical records are not created to support research. Anybody who's a physician knows that they are specifically there to support, everybody knows this, not just physicians, to support clinical decision making, and therefore are filled with ordering bias, charging bias, all kinds of bias. Yet, you can use them to investigate focused hypotheses that come from a number of sources, including the population databases. So I think that this is a nice little example of next generation health IT where we will be able to have active learning modules that are consistently and constantly generating hypotheses and then even looking for initial validation in a network of linked data sources, uh, just like what Brett described very well uh, earlier in this session. So I think I'll stop there. I'll thank my coworkers. Nick Tatnetti was the student who really did all this work. Collaborators at Stanford, Harvard, and Vanderbilt. That's the paper that was finally published describing the work. And I'd like to thank the uh, NIH for their support. Thanks. Thank you.